quick Other question. Um, a lot of people who have private health insurance, if they get sick or you know, have a minor illness or injury, they can't go to the emergency room to get treatment for that. They need to go to a primary physician. However, we hear stories about people on Medicaid who uh, go use the emergency room as a primary physician. Are, are you seeing any kind of uh, movement toward, A, providing more primary physicians in places where they aren't currently available and maybe the numbers they need to be, and B, trying to fix that and see how much would it cost? I mean, how much would we save? Right. Well, first of all, people don't go to the emergency room because they like to spend a lot of our money. So they usually go in there because they don't have ready access to a friend who they've known for years, a personal primary care provider. If we could put that in place, we can eliminate their need to go to more expensive and, frankly, less efficient ways of getting care. The worst place you can get primary care is in the emergency room. I guarantee you they have no interest and what you're coming in with if you've got a cold or a sore throat or backache or other stuff, they're there for you know, the life and death type problems. If we can just move people out of emergency room use the way many states have been able to do by reorienting their patients with a connection to primary care, we'll save enough money in the waste that's happening that we can actually start doing other better preventive things with patients. My issue with the hospitals and how big they are and what they have is that those are wonderful facilities, and I'm so glad they have all that capability there. What I want to do is have less people need that. And so our focus is to see if we can't maintain people in a healthier lifestyle and deal with those preventable illnesses so that they're not getting new parts put all over their body because they don't need those. No one wants to get hard caps. Nobody wants new joints. They get there by largely preventable type things that we can make an impact on, that's where the savings are going to be, I think, in the future for healthcare. But we've got to get a focus on prevention, or we'll never realize those savings that we're trying to pick think, up. And think about this, you know, with a primary care and coordinated care, uh, so you and I are, you know, hanging out and we get sick or whatever, and we're old, okay, we're older. We don't know where to go. So if you have a, a person who's a primary care person that coordinates the care, they direct you to the specialist, they direct you to the, to the uh, radiologist, they, that's the way, it, and it makes people more comfortable. You know, right now, well, where do I go? Who do I see? What do I do? And this idea of coordinated care is something that just makes so much sense, and I don't know how we never, we, we haven't been able to get there, but look, I don't want to paint this as a big rosy scenario, kumbaya, we've reached uh, nirvana, and uh, you know, and all that stuff, because it's going to there's going to be some very tough decisions made in regard to this budget. But you know, we get moving on the right track here in the right direction. I think we'll be okay. Good and, time for one more question. Yeah, Greg, it's, it seems that governors, prior governors, always seem to come back to you whenever there's a crisis and put you in charge of the department. Can you compare the current situation facing the state to what you've seen before? I wrote down some things I thought might be a question. That wasn't on the <laughs> that wasn't on my list. Yeah, you know these these are complicated organizations, and my experience is that everybody shows up every day wanting to do better for folks. But the risk of that not working goes up when you have a separation of leadership in where folks don't understand what another team is trying to accomplish. And you can end up with kind of this divergent approach that then comes in conflict in a way that causes things to fall apart. And I've seen a couple of things fall apart. Um, the answer to your question, I think, is leadership at the top and a commitment to seeing through the team you bring together in a way that even if it gets difficult, the, the thing you have to do is when it gets difficult and you're ready to bail out, you have to not bail out. You have to fix it. And that's very hard to do. And, you know, that's where you have to really respect folks coming out of very good circumstances. Everybody here has something they're doing that they really like doing. And they've made the decision to do this knowing that that risk exists and knowing the risk is greater today than it's ever been because of the budget. 
Um, so the answer is it's leadership and it's coordinating in a way that when you hit that, you work through it, you don't start backpedaling and fall down. You know, let me, let me just make one comment on that and then I want to just touch on my trip to Detroit yesterday. I remember we had our first budget committee meeting and I had Jim Nussel from Iowa and Susan Molinari from New York City. I said, Susan, you're going to have to give up some of your mass transit subsidies. There's no way I'm giving up those mass transit subsidies unless he gives up some of his agriculture subsidy. Said, we're either going to hang together or we're going to hang separately. Uh, Jim, when, the, when you're in the mine and you think there's only 10 breaths of air, you know what, I watched some of it last night. I watched uh, the president's speech. I think about that kid that the, you know, administered aid to, uh, to the congresswoman. I think about that lady, I think she was a senior, who grabbed the clip away from the gunman. Um, I think about the man that tackled the gunman worst of time. Could you imagine being right there, the guy with a gun, and yet people said, I must perform. Okay, I must be part of something. And what do we do? As an entire community, we say, there are heroes. I'm a big believer that people need to work to become a hero to somebody. So when, the, when there's not that many breaths of air in the mind, isn't it, don't we always salute the person that says, you take mine. But yet human nature pushes us to want to take it for ourselves. And that's what we have to do in Ohio. I, I don't know if I'm ever going to get this said right, but if we would all just realize that life is short and we will be judged by what we do by our fellow folks that we hang around with in terms of character and integrity, we'll get through this and we'll make the changes that are necessary. And I saw it happen in 1997. You know, I, I can tell you, those negotiations, which went on, it seemed, as Wayne Struble likes to say, seemed like it was for 10 years. I guess it was, you know, I don't know if it was a year or six months, I can't recall anymore, but Republicans and Democrats given up stuff they cared about because we did it as a team. And that's what it's going to take in terms of this budget, health transformation. It's like with transportation. Okay, we're not going to give you my buddies a deal for concrete. Not going to happen. Let's figure out how to do things better and smarter. That's what this is all about, what my mother used to say about lifting the bar. Okay, I want to talk a word about my trip to Detroit yesterday. It was very sobering, and in some ways very disturbing. I heard words like um, not competitive, I heard words like non-cooperative. I've heard I heard words like created a bad attitude and a bad impression. Um, look, the auto industry isn't just going to come up, just jump up and leave, you know. And I'm sure you know, Scott and I've been talking about this. You call their PR guys; they'll paint a nice picture. But I had both conversations in the room with my colleagues and, and private conversations. Um, with at least two of the three major companies, we got, we got a ways to go. And you have to realize that in the auto industry, they don't like figure out what they're going to do and then they go do it. They plan over a long period of time and once a decision is made about where they're going to locate a plant, they don't reverse that decision. If they all of a sudden say, you know, we're not going to have a plant in X community because they go through their internal planning, you're not going to change it. You're going to have the governor that, you know, we do all the, you know, we could shoot off fireworks and, you know, leap parade. They're not going to change. We are not viewed in that community as the most forward-looking state. Now, they, it was a good thing I went up there yesterday because I, I'm figuring I ought to have an inaugural every week, and I'll tell you why. They said, we cannot believe that you are here two days after your inaugural. See, that sent a message to them that was a big message. So I figure if we have an inaugural every week, I can go two days and visit some company. This is a very serious matter. It involves taxes. It involves regulation. It involves being able to respond to their concerns. It involves what you do with an EPA. It involves what you do with 
with all types of regulation and job training. All these companies are trying to job train. You might recall during the campaign, I said that you know the bulk of the money goes for training people who've lost their jobs. So in other words, you got to get really hurt before we'll help you. Very dumb. So we've got to be involved in retraining. We have to be involved in having organized labor be very cooperative. We have to be involved in not having the legislature pass a bunch of stuff that sticks uh, the auto companies in the eye. We've got to be careful. We have to do a whole series of things comprehensively. But I told them yesterday we are open for business. And they looked at me and said, thank God. So I wanted to let you know this is not an easy situation but perhaps one that is um, that's solvable. Our goal initially is keep the comp jobs we have before we can even think about getting more. We've asked the companies to give us a list of things that we could help them with. Mark Kwame was with me, the, our new director of department development, establish a good relationship. We, as you know, we had Gordon Gee, we had President of University of Toledo, we had a businessman from Cleveland, we had Wayne Struble. You know, they, these meetings were frank, they were honest, and I, they have given us sort of a path and a pathways to do what we need to do to make sure that Ohio is strong as it relates to auto, manufacturing, suppliers, huge impact on the state of Ohio. Thank you all very much.